What's the goal of basketball? To win, right? But not just to win individual games. The ultimate goal is to win a championship. Of course, basketball is a team sport. Championships are won by the most complete, most inspired team. Every champion deserves credit, but the question on my mind is, who's the greatest team of all time? With apologies to Bill and Wilt, I have a list of eight teams since 1970 that I want to look at as having a claim to that distinction. It is a loaded question, and one that I ultimately can't answer. Is it the teams that were front runners from beginning to end? The ones who were unbeatable at their peak? Maybe the ones who tapped into something special and overcame countless obstacles? There is no right answer. It's your job to make your own call and it's my job to make the case. So today, I'll be making the case for the 2017 Golden State Warriors as the greatest basketball team of all time. There's a lot to unpack with the 2017 Warriors. I think that the first thing I should do is acknowledge my own bias. I don't normally do that in these videos. I try really hard to present each case with as little of my own personal preference as possible. But I think it is important for this team that you know, I did not enjoy these Warriors. I lost a considerable amount of interest in the sport of professional basketball because of them. And when I did watch, I was usually actively rooting for them to lose. Some of you might ridicule me and call me a hater for that. Some of you might sympathize with me, and some of you might be indifferent. All of that is fine and dandy. I'm just letting you know where I stand before we get going. Because if you are like me, and you weren't a huge fan of these warriors, it can make it really hard to give them their just due, let alone make the case for them as the greatest team ever. But, hey, that is the name of the game. Let's start with the basics. The Warriors were led by a quartet of all-stars in Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, Klay Thompson, and Draymond Green. Zaza Pachulia was their most often used big man. Former Finals MVP Andre Iguodala was the designated sixth man. Sean Livingston was a super sub in his role. Patrick McCaw was an excellent contributor as a rookie. David West was a steal playing on a veteran minimum contract. And JaVale McGee, Kevon Looney, and James Michael McAdoo were all reserve big men. That group of players racked up 67 wins in the regular season and posted the best playoff record in the history of the NBA, losing just one game on their road to the championship. The statistics bear out their dominance. They posted the third highest offensive rating of any team to play an 82-game schedule behind just the 2019 Warriors and the 87 Lakers. Their 11.6 net rating is the third highest of all time. They have the fourth best point differential, and their 83 and 16 combined record sits only behind the 96 Bulls in win percentage. Already, just that, their on paper resume has this team in vaunted company. An offense on par with the 87 Lakers, a margin of victory in the same stratosphere as a team like the 71 Bucks, star power to rival that of the 86 Celtics, and a win percentage only topped by the 96 Bulls. But now we can add some context. To start, let's give a little rundown on how this version of the Warriors came together. Just one year prior, the 2016 Golden State Warriors were rock stars. They were tearing through the league, setting records and revolutionizing the game as they went. They fully tapped into the potential of spacing, ball movement, and the three-point shot, ending the regular season with 73 wins, the most ever. Steph Curry won his second consecutive MVP, becoming the first player to do so with a unanimous vote. As the playoffs began, all eyes were focused on the Warriors and their attempt at submitting the best basketball season of all time. After breezing through the first two rounds, they met the Oklahoma City Thunder in the Western Conference Finals. The Thunder, spearheaded by a generational talent named Kevin Durant, were on the cusp of shocking the world after building a 3-1 lead over the Warriors. 
The Warriors overcame the odds and rallied back to win the series, only to blow their own 3-1 lead in the NBA Finals to LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers. To say that the result was stunning is the understatement of the century. They rallied back and fought, only to suffer one of sports' greatest collapses. And then, Kevin Durant signed with them. At that point, all hell broke loose. The Warriors went from being a feel-good story about underdogs who turn into MVPs and All-Stars to villains. And Durant was the magnet for almost all of that vitriol and anger. At face value, fans were upset because it made Durant look like a frontrunner. He joined the team that beat him. The team that he and his team choked a 3-1 lead to. And as the season progressed, and as the hate persisted, Durant fueled it. He wanted people to understand. He wanted people to accept that it was the best decision for him. He didn't lean into any villain narrative or develop indifference. He used burner accounts on Twitter to defend himself. He actively argued with media personalities and fans that criticized him. He might have been better off just telling everyone that it was his decision and that if they didn't like it, they could fuck off. Nobody wanted to give Durant or the Warriors credit because of the stink around a former league MVP joining a team that won 73 games and had beaten him in the playoffs. It was a move that killed any hope of any other team winning the championship. Oddly, it was a point of contention that Durant was too perfect of a fit. It wouldn't be compelling in a wow, how are they going to figure this out kind of way. This wasn't going to end up like the 2011 Heat or the 2013 Lakers. Durant complimented everything that the Warriors did, and the Warriors were the perfect team to accentuate and highlight all of Durant's strengths. It created an alarming talent imbalance and killed parity. There existed no timeline of reality in which a healthy Warriors team would not win the championship. With Kevin Durant, the Warriors became invincible. And that was the problem because it felt unfair. Like a middle school kid bringing their high school sibling to a pickup game. Almost like it violates some unspoken rule of the game. Yeah, I'll play you and your friends. If you guys just happen to be better than us, you're better than us. If you kick our ass, you kick our ass. But now you've stacked the deck. Of course we're gonna lose. Admittedly, it's a silly problem. It's whining and bitching done by the group of people who have the least amount of say in the outcome of sports. It's a problem reckoned with entirely by the audience. It shouldn't and doesn't matter to a professional sports team if the audience doesn't like them or thinks that they're too good. But it begs a larger question and one that I don't think has an answer. What do we want? What do fans want? Do we want parody? The Lakers, the Celtics, the Cowboys, the Patriots, the Yankees. Leagues are defined by and sustained by their most successful franchises. So do we want dominance? The college football playoffs and UConn women's basketball both stand as testaments to the fact that too much ass-kicking tends to lose its attractive luster. So do we want underdogs? Do we want comebacks? Loyalty? Do we want a compelling narrative? And when athletes have a choice and a say in the matter, as LeBron James once asked, what should they do? Should they do what we want them to do? How can they when we don't even know what the hell we want? Kevin Durant did what he wanted to do. He joined the Golden State Warriors because he wanted to, because he thought it was the best move for his career and for his life. Maybe he won't say it, but I will. If we didn't like it, we can all fuck off. So with that mindset, can we finally talk about how good this Warriors team was? Because damn, this Warriors team was good. You know what else is good? My segues. And the sponsor of this video, NordVPN. If you've been on the internet for any amount of time, you know that it can be a spooky place. We all know to be careful with our clicks, but these days, even our best friends at Facebook are looking a little shady. And that is why you need NordVPN. You've been around, you know what's up. NordVPN creates a virtual private network 
a secure connection to the internet that keeps your data safe from everyone. From those rascally knuckleheads at big tech companies, all the way down to your local library creep. And NordVPN doesn't just protect your data. By connecting to different VPN servers, you can get around geo-locked restrictions on shows and movies. Did you like Squid Game and Parasite? Check out some other South Korean shows and take full advantage of your streaming services. To get started, go to nordvpn.com slash Clayton to get 73% off the two-year plan plus an additional month for free. It's a great deal, I use it all the time, and NordVPN offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so if you're not completely satisfied within the first month, you get your money back. Huge thanks to NordVPN for their support and a great product. The face of the Warriors was, and likely will always be, Stephen Curry. He's a franchise cornerstone on par with Tim Duncan, as accommodating and low ego as any superstar to ever come through basketball. He has the sickest handles outside of Kyrie Irving in the league today, has developed into a great finisher around the rim with either hand, moves off the ball so effectively and consistently that he's become a textbook case, and imparts a sizable, observable gravitational effect on the game. He is the greatest shooter in basketball history, and it isn't even close. He takes the most threes of anyone ever and makes them more accurately than almost anyone ever. He is a fearless shot taker, possessed by an understated self-assurance that, in any other player, would look like insanity. His ability to shoot from almost literally anywhere, over any kind of defense, on the catch or off the dribble, has made Steph the demigod of one of basketball's fundamental techniques. For generations, the most lethal weapon in NBA history has been Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's sky hook. There's a good reason. It was a nigh unblockable shot that has never been replicated. The surest two points in basketball ever. As effective in 1969 during his time as a UCLA Bruin as it was in 1989, two decades later, as a Los Angeles Laker. It is still the gold standard. Steph's three-point shot might be silver. It is similarly unstoppable, similarly irreplicable, he will not supplant Kareem as the game's all-time leading scorer, but he will be immortalized as the game's greatest marksman, pushing what was a slowly rising analytic trend into a style of the mainstream. When he was drafted, the idea that his most valuable skill was his three-point shot was an insult. Now, the three-point shot is perhaps the most coveted skill in the sport. He ignited the most fevered arms race in basketball history while remaining the sole owner of the most devastating nuclear weapon in that arms race. None of that changed with the addition of Kevin Durant. He is the seed that was watered, the data point that trends chase, an outlier that has redefined what normal is. The scrawny, undersized, shoot-first point guard from Davidson with the weak ankles has become the most influential player of his generation and truly one of the greatest players of all time. What would the perfect backcourt partner to Steph Curry look like? Well, to make up for some defensive shortcomings, let's make this guy one of the most versatile stoppers at his size in the league. Steph's the best shooter ever, so let's take some pressure off of him by adding more shooting. In fact, the perfect partner for Steph would be the premier 3 and D player in the league. And if he could be similarly chill, low maintenance, and team focused, we'd be gravy. And gravy we are, because that player is named Clay Thompson. Clay's a hard player to pin down, literally and figuratively. He's about as consistent as they come. Despite that consistency, Clay can be volatile, and not in the occasional cold shooting night that affects all players kind of way. In the holy shit, this man is hotter than a $2 pistol kind of way. This is a guy who once went 13 of 13 to score 37 points in one quarter. This is a guy who once scored 60 points in 29 minutes. On December 5th, 2016, he did that, scoring 60 points without playing the fourth quarter. 
He's a catch and shoot virtuoso with picture perfect form. Yet he also brings a certain amount of unpredictability to his game. He's not afraid to take shots from the mid range, to put the ball on the ground with an escape dribble, or to drive to the hole. He's one of the most respected, versatile defenders in the game. He routinely guards the best perimeter player on the opposing team and can switch onto forwards without a drop in effectiveness. But he only has one all defensive selection on his resume. And his skills don't necessarily show up in blocks or steals. All of it only adds to the legend of Clay. He's multiple things at once. A glue guy, an all-star, a two-way dynamo, and a consistent threat with flawless form and hyper-efficient potential. He has world-class stamina, is as active off the ball as anyone else in the league, and never seems to rock the boat. As Steve Kerr once said, he isn't low maintenance, he's no maintenance. The Warriors bring out the best in him, and he brings out the best in the Warriors. Steph and Clay form arguably the greatest backcourt in NBA history. They're certainly the best shooting guard pair ever, the Splash Bros. Their attitudes are laid back, soft-spoken, and often non-confrontational. So this team needs a dog, and a dog they have in Draymond Green. I do have to say, as someone who loves the history of basketball, I have a tough time finding a suitable comp for Draymond. He's the leading example of what a positionless basketball player looks like. He's a little like Rodman, he's got some bird, a slice of Ben Wallace, a hint of Barkley, and a whole lot of stuff that's uniquely him. He's an undersized power forward at 6'6", who thrives as a small ball center. He's a gifted passer with stellar vision and instinct. He's a defensive stalwart, guarding all five positions ruthlessly and at the highest possible level. He is a basketball savant and affects the game with an almost telepathic quality. You've heard it before and it bears repeating. He is the heart and soul of the Warriors, a vocal, impassioned leader who gives this team an edge. I honestly don't think there's a more competitive player in the league today. He never backs down, never gives an inch to anyone. He knows his place and role perfectly and buys in totally to the team. The fire that he brings is a perfect complement to Steph, providing a yin to his yang as they fulfill their roles as dueling alphas. The dude's a savage. The kind of guy that you hate, that you love hating. He made it no secret that he wanted to win the Defensive Player of the Year award, so after proving himself the best defender in the league, he took home the Defensive Player of the Year award. Draymond is an anomaly. You wouldn't really want to play with him a whole lot in 2K. If you just pay attention to box scores, he's not as impressive as some other players. But there's a reason he was the Defensive Player of the Year. A first-team All-Defensive selection, and a third-team All-NBA pick. The dude is just a winner. That trio of players, Clay, Steph, and Draymond, were the core of the best regular season team ever. They were perfectly calibrated and revolutionary. And then they added Kevin Durant. The most dangerous scoring forward of all time, Kevin Durant. One of the greatest players of all time, Kevin Durant. There has never been and there will likely never be a player like him. He compensates for his wiry, lanky frame with unbridled scoring ability. He boasts nearly unlimited range and with his height presents maybe the most nightmarish offensive matchup in basketball ever. His lateral quickness is unnerving in a body that's seven feet tall. His athleticism is world class. His handle is filthy and his ability to come through in the clutch is top notch. Like we talked about earlier, his fit in the Golden State system was a no brainer. He doesn't need to dominate the ball to get his. And as is par for the course, he is a paradigm of efficiency. His career average shooting splits flirt at the 50-40-90 line. Much was made of the fact that someone would have to sacrifice on this Warriors team to accommodate Durant. Instead, Durant was the one who made the greatest adjustment. Aside from his rookie season, his scoring average dropped to a career low 25 points per game. Those points though came at a career high field goal percentage. 
The floor was as open as it had ever been for Durant, his opponents unable to key in solely on him. He was no longer relied on to be the team's dominant scoring option. And when he needed to step up, he was unassailably the best player on the Warriors. In the finals against a superb Cavs team that hit its stride in the playoffs and ran through the East, he went toe to toe with LeBron and put up outrageous eye-popping figures, hitting the series dagger in game three over his rival. The synergy of these four stars was dominant, unstoppable, immaculate basketball. If they weren't already, the Warriors became the model franchise in basketball, and their roster became the template for the league that we see today. All the buzzwords that flood airwaves and dominate columns are epitomized in these Warriors. Versatility, spacing, adaptability, shooting, analytics, and so on. In a very real way, the 2017 Warriors were the culmination of the two most prominent trends of that decade. They embraced analytics and positionless basketball. Teams are leaving no stone unturned in their pursuit of the next Stefan Draymond. And they also reaped the most extreme reward of the player empowerment movement. Durant's move to the Warriors has little precedent and is unlikely to ever be repeated. Imagine if Hakeem had joined the Bulls or if Moses Malone had joined the Celtics. That is the type of unreal, history-altering weight that this roster walked into stadiums with. Basketball cares about, is driven by, and has outcomes dictated by its stars more than any other team sport. This is not news, but it is imperative to understanding the strength of this Warriors team. Yes, the 0-1 Lakers had the best one-two punch ever in Kobe and Shaq. Yes, the 87 Lakers had two of the five best players ever in Magic and Kareem. The Bulls had the Goat and Pippen. The 86 Celtics had three guys on the 50th anniversary team. But this team, for my money, has the most star power of any team since the heyday of Bill Russell's Celtics. And it wasn't just that this team was threatening on paper. They were downright unfair when the games got started. We've barely mentioned the fact that their sixth man is one of the elite wing defenders ever. That Andre Iguodala is such a game changer on that side of the floor that he won a finals MVP award because he was tasked with guarding LeBron James. The fact that Sean Livingston, as Shea Serrano would say, would back you down into the core of the earth itself and swish a turnaround jumper right on top of your head. Are their big men very impressive? Not really. They're average at best. And that's fine, because that's not the way the Warriors play. When they need to come through, when they're tired of messing around, Steve Kerr opens up the safe and breaks out the secret weapon. It has a couple names. The Death Lineup, the Mega Death Lineup, the Hamptons Five, whatever. Steph Curry, Klay Thompson, Andre Iguodala, Kevin Durant, and Draymond Green. That five-man lineup outscored opponents by 23.4 points per 100 possessions. What would you do to stop them? It's not as simple as just saying, well, if you're the Bulls, you stick MJ on Steph, Harper on Clay, and Pippen on Durant. They are so creative, so active off the ball, and such a good passing team that those assignments would be forced to switch, then switch again, then switch again. The efficiency and lethality of the Warriors ball movement and shooting is such that you cannot make a mistake. You have to play the most star-studded roster of the past 50 years perfectly for 48 minutes defensively. And then, how will you still have enough gas in the tank to put points up? The weakness of this small ball lineup of death is in the event of an all-time center. Yeah, they probably couldn't go small for long stretches against a team with Shaq or Kareem on it. They'd give up some twos and some offensive rebounds. But still, that's just one guy. If the Warriors did go small against Shaq, who the hell is he going to guard? Is he going to try to follow Draymond around? The Draymond who pushes the ball up the court like Larry Bird? Setting screens, rolling to the basket, and dishing assists to the corners? As I learned in Kirk Goldsberry's Sprawl Ball, the three-point revolution is based on the fact that threes are worth more than twos. And in the economy of basketball, 
This is the team that is the best at the most valuable scoring method. It's just math. For every four threes that the Warriors make, you have to make six twos. It's why teams are content to just chuck them up now. It's ugly and it might be hurting the sport, but the trend exists for a reason. It's just math. This team doesn't just chuck up threes. They play an exquisite brand of basketball. Yeah, Durant left the Warriors in the wake of some drama and ego, but that doesn't exist here. This team just wants to win. They took the Spurs' beautiful game and turned the dial up to 11. It's poetry. It's almost ethereal, as close to the abstraction of modern basketball as we are ever going to get. The best of all worlds. They were an idea as much as they were a basketball team. They were dominance. I mean, 15 straight wins to start a postseason. That's the best winning streak in playoff history. Their 16-1 record is the best ever. They were one win away from an undefeated playoff run. In the part of the season that counts the most, when the chips are on the table and you're competing for your championship life, no one has been better than the Warriors. They were invincible. But you know what? Invincible isn't very satisfying. It's kind of boring. It's why Superman has kryptonite. On his own, Superman is way too powerful to be interesting. He can fly, he has x-ray vision, he has lasers that shoot out of his eyes. He's bulletproof. Superman against any villain ever is a no contest. So you have to have something that makes him mortal again. This Warriors team was invincible. In the context of narrative and storyline and intrigue, it sucks. They kicked the shit out of your team, and then they moved on to kick the shit out of the next team. There's nothing to talk about. But, in the context of the greatest team of all time, Invincible is unassailable. That's originally where I wanted to end the video. But I still don't think it does justice to the Warriors. Or at least it doesn't resolve the problem I'm trying to get at. As I wrote and researched the script for this video, I watched a lot of Warriors tape. A lot of video on Steph and Durant and Clay and Draymond from before and after 2017. And watching those guys play after the fact, especially now that they aren't all on the same team, I find myself marveling at the fact that they ever were to begin with. It is mind boggling. And it makes me feel a little bit guilty because I think about the fact that this might well have been the greatest basketball team ever, and I didn't even appreciate it. It makes me think about the question of what we want. We'll never know. There'll never be one concrete answer because it varies from person to person. So doesn't that make it all the more important that we appreciate what we've got while we've got it? I'm not saying I was wrong for not loving the Warriors, but I do regret not taking even a moment to understand how special it was. If I had to answer the question, I think I'm kind of like that kid in The Incredibles, sitting on his tricycle as Mr. Incredible gets out of his car. Well, what are you waiting for? I don't know, something amazing, I guess. Then I'll be damned if I didn't miss out on something amazing. If I am lucky enough to live a long life and to enjoy this wonderful sport of basketball for many more years, I look forward to the day when I can tell someone who wasn't there about the 2017 Warriors. They need to know that these Golden State Warriors were incredible. They were invincible. They were amazing.